I don't have an intro. I don't have a box. What I do have is an Eevee. No, it has nothing to do with the game. Blade Kitten is a comic series created by Steve Stamatiatis, a self-proclaimed creative force behind several hit games during his 25 years in the gaming industry. It stars Kit Ballard, a 24-year-old breaker who's a felion, which is space gibberish for Neko, which is anime gibberish for HOT. She's the last of her race, which was wiped out by the Darks. She fights using a free-floating sword that telekinetically follows her instructions, and she lives in a galaxy where Hex is currency and has a rival named Justice. I knew none of this when I picked up the game. I don't know when I got it, how I got it, where I got it exactly, but when I opened up my Steam page, there it was. So I decided to discover it for today. And by discovering it in that way, it kind of felt like a project given to you by a freshman in college. It's clearly very creative, and the writer has thought up deep, complex stories for these characters. But like most amateur writers, he falls into the pitfall of never actually giving us any of that information, and accidentally assuming that because he knows this information, we'll know this information. Our main character reacts to her villain as if they have some history from the literal moment the game begins. She uses acronyms and references her job as if we're all familiar with them. There's a nightmare sequence that shows some kind of backstory for the heroine, and it never actually is explained. A witch coven that clearly has some kind of history with her appears, and she references more things, but we've never seen any of this. Even once I realized there was a connected comic book, which I will mention was at the end of the game, but I'll rant on that kettle of miscooked pufferfish later, I could not read the comic to discover anything about what was going on because the comics cost money to read. Now, I'm not faulting Captain Steve for selling his comic and trying to make some money off of his abilities and creativity. Honestly, I'm a little bit jealous of him in that regard. And I can clearly see the level of creativity that has gone into this project just from what I see in the game. But firstly, by gaining any real understanding of what's going on in the game behind buying the comics, you limit your audience to those who have already read and love your comics. The idea may have been that new people would discover the comics through the video game, but those players have no idea what's going on. That lack of information doesn't leave one intrigued and curious, but instead ends up fostering a feeling of confusion throughout the game, turning into frustration at the end when you discover that there were answers the whole time, you just have to pay up if you want them. The second problem with this comes from an innate difference between writing for comics and writing a story. In comics, some things are expected to be skipped over because of the visual construction. A hero can jump from one point to another or an idea to another, and the reader infers what will happen in between from the breaks in the panels. In a story for a book or a game, there needs to be more tying elements, though. Kit constantly expresses distrust and frustration towards several characters, yet goes on to do what they say over and over. In a comic, that might seem normal, but in a game, it's sudden and rushed. In another part of the game, it's suddenly important to start freeing lizard people. Why are they down in these cages? How did they get there? Who told us we needed to get them out? And I might accept that Kit just stumbled across them and wanted to do the right thing, except that she seems like she expected them, or had even been sent to try to take them out. In the first half of the game, Kit is trying to get back some kind of device that has something to do with what her being what we have to assume is a bounty hunter. When she finally retrieves it, she says the person who stole it has locked it out, and she has to talk to someone about it, but she never talks to anyone about it, never mentions it again, nothing. I thought she was on her way to a location to report in about it, but instead the location is something totally other. I haven't played the sequel, so I can't say if he's already done this, but clearly Captain Steve is much better at art and world creation than he is at traditional writing. He needs to hire a writer or editor to help him make games, to sit him down and make him fill in the plot holes, to go back and give plot threads a real introduction and to make sure that all those threads are tied up and not just forgotten about. I absolutely loved the creativity that I was seeing throughout this game. I just really expected better focus and editing from someone with his level of experience. And this need for self-editing and that inexperienced writer's trap of, I know this so it makes sense, will pervade the game. The game opens with Kit getting her 
pregnancy test strip from Tron stolen, her ship blown up, and immediately starts getting attacked by the local law enforcement. At this point of the game, I was assuming that more would shortly be made clear. Rather than be frustrated with the writing, I was actually pretty into the game. The movements are fluid, the voice acting is just the right level of cheesy, and Kid is a Neko. I don't know if that should count as a plus for this game, but I'm going to count it as one because I love Nekos. The lines of enemies lead us to a city, but Justice flies off again, so Kit must ask a vaguely racist shopkeeper for help. Before we can understand anything he's saying or get help from him, his lunch is stolen by a floating... Alright, I think this is meant to be a space cat when your actual space cats are sexy. But instead, it's creepy. Kit thinks it's adorable and names it Skiffy, but that's... It's just not cute. I think it's what would happen if you dropped a Charmander at birth. But with the semi-eaten lunch recovered, we can return to the shopkeeper and get... a newt. No, I'm not making a joke there, that's what this creature is called, a newt. So with Skiffy and Newt in tow, we must begin my frustrations with the game. For reference, we're about an hour in now, and it's starting to become clear that nothing will be explained, and the previously fluid combat is starting to show holes and feel very clunky. For instance, one of the main mechanics of the platforming is that Kit can stick to walls and ceilings if you jump at them. But as you try to change from one side of the surface to another, about a quarter of the time Kit will just fall off of it. Each area is also designed to be traversed in any way, so the ability to climb walls and ceilings makes parts I think were intended to be maze-like as easy as pick a direction and keep going. Meanwhile, the sections that require you to go in one specific direction to open a door or talk to an NPC become incredibly confusing because the wall and ceiling climbing gives far too many options on where to go to find that one switch. That's kind of the opposite problem these newt sections have, though. Now and then, the game turns into a runner game. You cannot stop, you cannot turn around, you must keep running and jumping in response to whatever shows up on the screen. I never made it through any of these on the first or second try. The controls and situations are just not set up well enough to call this anything but trial and error. Also, several of these seem to count as boss fights for portions of the game. That's not a boss fight. A boss should be a combination of everything you've learned coming together with a climax of tension and action, not a running segment that you'll have to do repeatedly between trial and error and loose controls. Finally, I have one more complaint at this point of the game. I know, I know, I'm doing nothing but complaining, but there's reasons. Remember, I said this was about an hour into the game. They have only now finally mentioned how to find the shop, or that a shop exists. I had actually given up on collecting the massive amounts of hex laying everywhere because I thought they were useless and were just points. So, after several runner sections, we catch up with Justice and get tricked again with the ease of throwing a fake ball for a dog. Luckily, Skiffy saves our glow stick of import, but as I said earlier, Justice locked it out trying to use it, so we need to go report this to someone. We break back into the city, and as I also already said, it turns out that we are not working our way back to actually report to anyone. Instead, we get back and meet the guy who supposedly runs the defense of this world who actually does nothing. And because I can hear you wondering it, no, we don't mention our glow sticks predicament. Oh well, let's go travel to the underground areas to help check in on the front lines of a battle and to help the soldiers that we are killing in droves. Seriously, we are more dangerous to these soldiers in red than any battle or war ever could be all on our own. And we kill myriads of these guys who are completely safe from the war inside the tunnels. But hey, it lets us break out really ungrateful lizard people, so... win? Once we break out to the outside and find the war, we meet the first person of the army who doesn't instantly want to kill us. Instead, he gives us a disc to bring to the commander. So, this would mean that the army stops attacking us and we'll fight whoever these guys are fighting, right? Yeah, no! We still apparently insulted all of these troops and mothers and they just can't let that go for us to help them. Even the commander is a jerk to us once we make it here to deliver the disc. Dude, do you not realize how many of your men get slaughtered out there? We beat up a giant robot. We deserve a little more respect out of you, if not your outright fear. But instead, we are called a little girl and sent away. Whereupon, one of the runner sections as a boss fight appears and we combat Cthulhu. And these soldiers hate us so much, despite our attempts to help them, that they will ignore the Godzilla-sized monster from their nightmares to try to kill us first. 
After repeated restarts because of trial and error on where to go against a boss that takes most of your health in one hit, you finally get to lose to the monster anyway and fall into a deep, seemingly bottomless pit. As Kit wakes back up, everyone should all have the same reaction, the dream sequence. That thought is erased as the game holds up a plot jump and hole so big that it is a giant middle finger to the player. Kit freaks out seeing these black creatures calling them darks. So remember, I do not know this is a comic yet at this point. I do not know anything I told you at the start of this review, except that she's seemingly a bounty hunter and is named Kit. So, for people like me who discovered the game first, what is a dark? What's going on? Why is Kit afraid of them? No, seriously, she is freaking out, and she's talking about killing them all. Why did our heroine commit genocide? Why are there tiny cutscene clips of Justice laughing? What is going on here? Oh right, dream sequence. Now, now that still leaves a lot of questions I'm really not sure anyone but Captain Steve has answers for. Well, this fat old lizard man saved us, and he sends us off to... somewhere. This somewhere leads us to an epic battle with a mech that's almost impossible to take down. That's probably because I did not realize until the final fight with him that you could only hurt it by hitting it in the head. While this is yet another example of things never being explained because Captain Steve already knew them, the fact that I actually beat the robot repeatedly without ever realizing I had to hit him in the head makes it difficult to get mad. The lizards thank us for killing their robot and saving them, and send us on. We get sidetracked by witches that we apparently have some kind of history with that will never be explained to us, who wants to recover an artifact. Not too difficult, get the artifact, and the asshole captain forces us to hand it over. Now, I'd like to bring up another issue with the writing. It's called ludonarrative dissonance. This is the idea that there is a disconnect between the gameplay and the story that the game is trying to tell. For example, if during gameplay your character dies from fall damage, but then in a cutscene, your character is able to leap from an incredible height and hit the ground without taking any damage. That's an example of ludonarrative dissonance. It's a rather obvious example, and there can be plenty of different ways that this comes up. Usually, I either don't really believe in ludonarrative dissonance, or it doesn't really bother me. But in this game, the captain has himself and two of the most basic enemies in the game. We have literally slain hundreds of these enemies without breaking a sweat by this point in the game. Are you really going to claim that just because they have their guns pointed at us, we can't fight back and we simply have to hand over this magical object? Even after he declares he's going to kill us, we don't attack him, threaten him, or do anything other than express annoyance and look pouty. We also don't seem to be on good terms with the witches, and Kit seemed genuinely nervous about meeting with them. But just turning over the artifact they wanted doesn't cause us a moment's hesitation? It's really hard to take this heroine seriously as a badass when she's so pathetically weak and easily tricked in cutscenes. Well, we run away again, and the hologram of the useless ranger guy asks us to go save a village from stampeding death cows. We make them clear off easily, and oh right, we came to this planet to catch a lizard woman with a bounty. But she tries to blow us up and runs away, so instead we check back in with the ranger who directs us to talk to... Lizard witches. Why? Who are they? What does anything mean anymore? Yeah, who knows? What little cohesive story this game had is really falling apart as it comes close to the ending. It seems to be the directions to the secret base of the enemies, but actually it's a giant robot fight? Oh good, another boss with unclear rules that are learned by trial and error, and your own clunky controls or Kit's refusal to cling to a ceiling getting me killed more than anything else. But, after eight full minutes of restarting boss fights later, we realize that she was never actually a bad guy. We've been fighting on the side of the evil army that's suppressing the local citizens, and this lady is the leader of the rebels. She was willing to die before accepting our help, out of the belief that we've been deliberately helping the army to bring about the genocide of her race and the resurrection of whatever darks are. So Kit knocks her out, throws her aboard a rescue ship, and when the lizard lady comes to, Kit explains that she's a good guy and that the darks wiped out her people too, which again, if you only picked up this video game, is a complete surprise that's played as something the player has common knowledge of yet again. The ranger and the lizard lady's son back us up and she's instantly allied with us. Game over. Go by episode two which supposedly is the same size as this game was, which in my opinion makes it another game, not an expansion to me, so 
we're not discovering it today. So in the end, the game suffers from clunky controls, amateur at best storytelling, a meaningless ending that's just meant to make you buy Chapter 2 rather than actually tie anything together or answer any questions, ludonarrative dissonance that actively damages what story there is and any vision of the heroine as anything dangerous or badass, and what seems like a rushed ending in an only three hour long game. And yet, I actually enjoyed this game. I know that I've done nothing but complain about it from start to finish, but weirdly enough, I really enjoyed playing it. And no, it's not just because Kit is a Neko in tight, alluring clothing with a sword, though that's always a plus. There's something about the way the game feels when it's going right. Maybe it's that the enemies are never really hard, so you feel awesome. Maybe it's how much fun it is to see the cutscenes, even if they won't make any sense. Maybe it's the pure creativity that I said earlier you can feel through every part of the game. Sure, it's a little clunky and much more amateur than I would expect from someone of his experience, but the joy and passion that comes through in the game can be felt as the gamer, and results in an enjoyment of the game even if it is a little bit off. It's probably the definition of a guilty pleasure game for me. I can tell it's not great, but I enjoy playing it anyway. So, because of that, if anything you've seen looks like something you would enjoy, or if you just want to bask in one man's creative ideas, even if he hasn't put them forward in the best way, pick this game up.